Right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third and final episode of this season's New York State of Wine. Uh, this episode is titled Chardonnay Showdown. So crafted in New York, but inspired from everywhere, New York is a unique community of passionate producers who approach winemaking with a multitude of personalities and backgrounds. And we'll see some of those personalities here today. Uh, this episode, we're gonna take a look at New York state of wine with Chardonnay, a focus on Chardonnay. Um, and they'll, we'll look at New York Chardonnay examples, as well as those from Burgundy, Chile, and New Zealand. Uh, so I know many of you have the wines in front of you, and um, it just keep in mind that might not be the same uh, tasting order that appears on your tasting sheet. Um, we've done a uh, we've switched it around a little bit, so just uh, keep keep on track with the webinar, and and you'll know which wine to taste when. So before um, I turn it over to our hosts, I also just wanted to say uh, say a, keep, a few housekeeping things, which is about the communication methods that we have available. So we have a chat section and a Q&A section. You'll see that the chat section is more of an informal way for you to communicate with other participants, um, but just be sure to select everyone in the two field as it can default to panelists only. And then the Q&A section, um, and this is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. Uh, we will have a Q&A time at the, at the end, um, but we'll try to also answer your questions as we go along as well. So now I'll go ahead and turn it over to our hosts, David Kermode and Renee Langdahl. Well, hello uh, from London. Uh, we welcome uh, Renee Langdahl from Denmark uh, to uh, this uh, particular broadcast. Uh, Renee has been the uh, wine editor at the Danish food and uh, wine magazine Gastro uh, since 2005. Uh, he's a lecturer at the Danish Wine Academy. Uh, he's been doing that since 2007. Uh, where he teaches all the new world wine countries, including the USA, uh, including New York, of course. Um, and he also teaches uh, Burgundy and Bordeaux. Uh, he started his blog, renelangdahl.com, in 2018. And he speaks at seminars, webinars, conferences, you name it, on uh, all wine-related uh, subjects. Uh, he's written a book about the best producers in Tuscany, and he's currently a stage two uh, at the uh, Institute of um, Masters of Wine. So uh, that is uh, pretty impressive stuff. Uh, he started writing about wine while he was at university in 1993. Uh, he's also a historian specializing in European cultural uh, history and uh, perception. Um, and since 2020, he's run a successful podcast about wine, which is now by far the most downloaded wine podcast in Denmark. Thank you, David. Um, and now on to you. Uh, in the UK, David, you are, as a, you are a journalist, writer and broadcaster and international wine judge with two decades of experience in print, online TV and radio and a passion for drinks for the drinks world. Starting uh, his career in local journalism, David became a radio broadcaster at London's LBC, then moved to television where he edited the award-winning BBC Breakfast, Channel 5 News, and also worked in senior, ma senior management roles at Sky and ITV. After gaining a diploma at the London's Wine and Spirits Education Trust, that's more than I have, David, just so <laughs> you know, <laughs> he launched the Vinoceros. David appears on Britain's most popular daytime show, ITV's This Morning, host the Drinking Hour with David Kermo on Food FM um, and co-presents a monthly wine hour on BBC local radio. David is the wine columnist for Club Manologique and also regularly writes for trade publications like The Buyer and Harper's, a host of corporate tastings and consumer masterclasses. He regularly chairs industry events and conferences is a senior judge and an ambassador for the International Wine and Spirit Competition, and also works as communications consultants. So there we are. We're going to introduce our uh, guests uh, very shortly as well, because uh, that's uh, 
uh, what um, what you're here for, really. But just before we uh, we do that, um, let's uh, let's take a, a look at the sort of subject matter today, and uh, we're going to kick off. Um, we're going to talk about Chardonnay in New York specifically in a moment. But first, Rene, a few thoughts from you on Chardonnay more generally as a variety. Yes, it's obvious probably for most of our participants that's, that this is a world famous and, uh, and, and globally influential uh, grape variety grown almost all over the world, at least between the 30th and the 50th uh, uh, latitudes degree. But of course, there are a couple of key regions we have to mention in, uh, in this perspective and in, in relation to, to a tasting where uh, New York producers try to, to, to relate uh, the styles of, in, in New York uh, of Chardonnay to, to some of the world's um, leading styles. Bourgogne, of course, um, at least three centers in, uh, in Bourgogne, uh, style-wise. There is the more moderate uh, styled, uh, clearly cool climate style, and often very reductive style of, of uh, the northern part of Burgundy. Uh, Chablis. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, the classic area in, in Côte d'Or, Merceau, Puligny, Chassagne, with uh, much more oak influence uh, than in Chablis, usually at least. And you could take in also uh, the Macron style, which is the warmer part of, uh, of the center of Burgundy with a little bit of more uh, tropical fruit, fruit where you Kind of relate, you can relate the style a little bit more to some of the overseas uh, countries internationally. Um, several places, but if I had to choose uh, some of the, the main centers for, for top quality uh, Chardonnay, uh, it would be coastal California. First of all, coastal uh, California, both the northern parts in the, in the Sonoma area, but also in the Santa Barbara uh, area down south where we have uh, Santa Rita Hills, for, for example, as a, as a good example of, of a very, almost, yeah, some, you would say re restrained style of, of uh, California Chardonnay, but typically with a little bit more enhanced um, fruitiness than uh, if you compare to, for example, classic Burgundian styles. Uh, Australia must be mentioned too, uh, several places, places there practicing the new, uh, you could say the new cool climate style, high altitude areas like uh, Tumbarumba, Orange, for example, uh, also Adelaide Hills, um, and even down south in Tasmania with a very, very almost lowish uh, alcohol level and very, very pronounced uh, acidity for the moment and much more restrained in, uh, in, in the influence of oak. New Zealand, South Africa, uh, coastal areas in South Africa uh, have to be mentioned too. But those are some of the, the, the key regions for, for Chardonnay uh, stylistically at, at the moment. You could say, if, if I, I have to talk a little bit about the styles we see internationally for the moment. And um, there is a clear, in my opinion, there is a clear dominance uh, for the moment of, of this style you could say would be Chablis style because the ideally is it's 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 a restraint um, moderate alcohol based typically around 13 percent um, a little bit of mellow influence but a quite subdued uh, influence of oak if any at all but what's most important is is um, is the reduction reduction the reductive style this uh, yeah, in, in English spoken, in English speaking uh, countries, we, we all often refer to, to the struck match uh, effect, uh, which is, yeah, having success everywhere you produce uh, Chardonnay for the moment. Um, and usually when the, the, the other style, the more classic style is much more oak influenced. Uh, if we go back to, to the center in Côte d'Or, in Marceau, Puligny and Tassiane, for example, um, usually you feel much more oak influence, it's, it's, it's fatter, it's more oily, um, also with a much more uh, pronounced um, mellow 
uh, or malolactic uh, influence stylistically. In the vineyards, there are some interesting developments because for many years, um, much focus has been put on, on Chardonnay in, um, if, in, in the more high yielding uh, type, types or, 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 or subtypes or, or, or clones, you could say. If you go to some of the, the, the main, area, main areas for the moment, uh, I mentioned California, I mentioned Australia. It seems, uh, although it, it seems now that there is a little bit of a switch going back to some of the more low yielding uh, types or uh, biotypes and, uh, and low yielding clones, uh, especially the, the, the point of, of Milrandage is very interesting. Uh, in English, you, you, you often call it hens and chicks. So it's, it's a combination in the same cluster of small berries and uh, bigger berries. The interesting here, uh, the interesting thing here is that you, with this combination, you are able to obtain much more concentration and intensity in uh, the final wine. And a very important point is that usually you have a little bit of more phenolic influence, a little bit more backbone. You could even say tannin, but of course, it depends on how you make the wine. And there you also see a division for the moment uh, because some producers prefer to use the old fashioned style of crushing the grapes um, with a little bit of maceration. So giving a short skin contact to add phenolics and, and a little bit of maybe bitterness or tannin even. But the, much, the, the more uh, typical style you see almost everywhere and also even in, in, in classical uh, Burgundy is, is a whole cluster pressing, direct pressing of whole clusters to obtain a very, very pure must going directly into barrels uh, to start, uh, to start the, the fermentation. So you really get a, a, a good influence of, of the oak, uh, but and usually you won't get these um, reductive uh, characters that you see in, in some of the, the other styles. So it's, it's more pronounced and focused on, on fresh fruit. That's a quick run through of, uh, of the styles uh, I see internationally uh, for the moment. And we'll probably, yeah. we'll, we'll get more into detail when we see the wines, because at least the overseas wines that I've had to present here, uh, from, which are not from, from um, uh, from, from New York State, uh, they, they, are, they are quite different in, in style. Great, right. Well, thank, thank you for that um, fascinating um, uh, overview, uh, Rene. Just a brief introduction uh, to Chardonnay in New York. Um, it might uh, not yet at least be the, the most famous grape coming from uh, New York's uh, wine regions, but it's uh, changing fast. Uh, it might surprise uh, some of you at least to learn that it's uh, relatively speaking and everything is relative um uh, it has a long history really uh, it was the first of the uh, vitis vinifera varieties uh, to be successfully planted uh, in the state uh, you have to go back to the early pioneers of vinifera like dr constantin frank uh, for the earliest examples uh, from the 1970s onwards it began to pop up a, a bit more usually as part of a a patchwork of, of vines and that patchwork still very much exists to this day where you have Vitis vinifera alongside um, Vitis uh, labrusca or, or some of the French uh, hybrids. Um, and these days uh, Long Island, where we're going to go to first, is celebrated for its Chardonnay. Uh, the vines really thrive there in the, the maritime climate uh, alongside um, uh, the likes of uh, Merlot, for example. And then Chardonnay, I think, is increasingly um, winning acclaim in the Finger Lakes, too. Uh, in the northwest of uh, New York State, there's the map. It is, um, you know, it's a very big state. So this is uh, 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 very spread out. But just to give you a sense of perspective, you, you, if you fly up to the Finger Lakes from, uh, from, uh, from LaGuardia in New York, it's at least an hour's flight. And I think it's something like five hours drive, although I, I didn't drive it. And then you've got Long Island down there on the, uh, the bottom, uh, bottom right of the map. Uh, so yes, uh, we've got Finger Lakes winning acclaim. We've got um, Long Island um, celebrated already for, uh, for its uh, Chardonnay. But um, uh, in the Finger Lakes, at least, uh, it's still very much in the shadow of Riesling and Cabernet Franc. Um, uh, which uh, many of you will be familiar with from these uh, web webinars. Um, 
it has a pivotal role to play, I think, in what um, I really think is one of the most exciting things happening um, in New York at the moment, which is traditional method sparkling wine. Uh, we're going to come to that uh, in a minute. Uh, there is, of course, uh, Pinot Noir, a tiny bit of Mernier as well. Um, I was back in, uh, in the Finger Lakes back in uh, uh, March, in the middle of March, um, and tasting Chardonnay um, it was pretty new to me, um, I, I must uh, admit, from the Finger Lakes, obviously not uh, new to me more generally. Um, and I was really struck by the speed at which things are changing and the, and the profile and the sense that there is a, uh, a style being established uh, there as well. So more on that from the people that you really want to hear from. So let's introduce our three guests. Um, first of all, um, we have uh, from uh, Long Island, uh, we have Roman Roth. Uh, from uh, Wolfer Estate. Uh, Roman brings experience to his winemaking that covers three continents, stems from uh, the dream of a 16-year-old boy in Rothweil in Germany's Black Forest, uh, including a three-year apprenticeship at Kaiserstuhl Wine Cooperative, um, Oberrotweil, you'll have to excuse my German pronunciations, by the way, uh, working at, uh, as well at the Saintsbury Estate in California and also a very familiar name, Rosemount Estate in uh, New South Wales, Australia. And later back at, in Germany at Witzekeller Wiesloch. Um, after earning his Master Winemaker and Cellar Master degree from the College for Enology and Viticulture in uh, Weinsberg, he became Wolfer Estate's uh, Vineyard's first winemaker in 1992. Uh, so he's been there 30 years, uh, dedicating himself to promoting not only the wines of Wolfram State, but of Long Island more generally, uh, where he's consulted with numerous vineyards. And he's currently the president of the Long Island Wine Council. So, Roman, uh, welcome along. Hello, everybody. Thanks for the nice introduction. I will put on my best Long Island accent for you. Right. Right. And I will present Peter Bell. Uh, Peter Bell has been making wine in the Finger Lakes since 1990, first at Dr. Frank's winery. I, that's the Dr. Frank that David mentioned. And since 1995 at Fox Run Vineyards. He holds a Bachelor of Applied Science degree in Enology from Charles Sturt University in Australia and an Honours Bachelor of Arts degree in Anthropology from Trent University in Canada. Before coming to the Finger Lakes, Peter, Peter worked as a winemaker in Australia and uh, New Zealand. His winemaking expertise has been sought in Serbia, Hungary, France, Spain, Canada, Australia, and China, and throughout the United States. In two, 2004, he was granted a teaching fellowship at the University of Adelaide's Wine Science Department. He was named one of the 20 most admired winemakers in America by Vineyard and Winery Management Magazine in 2014. So welcome to you, Peter Bell. I think you may be muted, Peter. Yep, I'm sorry. I should be, I should know this by now. Thank you, Renee, very much. And uh, thank you for the nice comments. Welcome everybody. And last but not least, uh, to Nathan Kendall. Um, Nathan Kendall Wines, uh, founded in 2011 uh, by Finger Lakes native Nathan Kendall, uh, an internationally trained winemaker with experience in Sonoma, the Willamette Valley, uh, Waipara in New Zealand, Adelaide Hills in Australia, and the Mosul in Germany. Uh, although the plan was always to return home to the shores of Seneca Lake, despite so that extensive international experience. Um, his passion is to create wines in an old world style using quality grapes and minimal intervention, having traveled throughout the world, focusing on cool climate regions and varietals. He's focused on Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and sparkling wine, expressing the unique terroir of each of the individual sites uh, through low intervention winemaking. Um, welcome along, Nathan. Hello, thanks for the intro. I'm happy to be here. You're very welcome. Let's go first um, to uh, the first of our uh, guests and the first of our wines. You're, you're kind of uh, welcome to, to obviously crack these open uh, whatever you want really, but it, it makes sense to do it while we're talking about the wine. So 
Um, Roman, um, if you could first of all just tell us a bit about Long Island's vineyards and their history for us. Sure. Uh, Long Island was started in 1973. So the first vinifera vines, actually that's what's nice about Long Island. It's close to 3000 acres of vines and it's basically all vinifera. So that was the start. Nobody thought you could grow grapes here, but it is a blessed region. We have this maritime influence. You can see the Long Island Sound between Connecticut and Long Island, and of course the Atlantic on the other side. And as you see at the end, Long Island turns into like a lobster, two lobster claws at the end. There's the North Fork and the South Fork, which is called the Hamptons. And again, there's another influence of this stuff, of the, the bay it's called, which warms up cold air. So there's a couple of benefits about this. Here you can see, so in the winter time, when cold air comes from, from Canada down, uh, it warms up going over the Long Island Sound. And as a result, we get no winter damage. So that's of course a great base and it certainly allows us to prune very aggressively early on. It's a, a great foundation where you, which you have. Uh, in the spring, we get no spring frost, which is the big blessings as we just heard again, second year in a row, Burgundy and South, some Southern French vineyards have frost again, which is terrible. And we don't wish that on anybody, but we certainly knock on wood are protected by our again Atlantic influence. So no spring frosts and then comes the summer, the summer, which is actually cooler. That's why people from Manhattan come out. So this is the, the Hamptons is the playground of the rich and famous, but it's also a lovely farming and the fisher community. So there's a lot of uh, farming, vegetable patches, great fish, great seafood. And of course, the wine is in between, which is a great place to be between all the mansions and the who knows what. So lovely place. It's cooler. That gives us a very nice, slow and steady ripening curve. We are on the same latitude, as you can see, as Madrid. So much further south than any French vineyards or German vineyards or any you know, Chardonnay from, from France again. So quite unique. This, and that's what makes Long Island so unique. There's this amazing sun, great for, for ripening your seeds, ripening your skins, getting great photosynthesis being also at the maritime influence. If it does rain the next day, it's blue sky again. So we don't have these you know, lingering bad weathers. Uh, there's a little danger that we could get a hurricane. That's the sort of the, the one little dan big danger that we have. Uh, but finally, what's most important is at the end ripening of Chardonnay that you want ripe fruit. And we're the last area in New York state to get a frost because we are again protected. It takes a little longer to get cold enough. So we have a long hang time. I think that's the key to ripen, to get mineral flavors, to get this elegant ripe finesse and make, make a great chardonnay that's still only 13, 13 and a half volume percent. So a lovely grape place to grow grapes. The soil is the Bridgehampton loam. It was a glacier that formed Long Island around, I don't know, 10,000 years ago, roughly. And we formed this, you know, Long Island, which has a great topsoil, have this, this clay, this low loam silt mix and on to, on, on to underneath is the gravelly sand. So great drainage, good water holding capacity. And so if you do a great job in your vineyard, which I can go back in detail a bit later, you can really make special wines. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to tasting it. So would you mind, uh, Roman, introducing us to the wine that we have uh, uh, the sample of, and maybe you can then tell us a bit about how sure. uh, Chardonnay, um, how Chardonnay evolved um, in in Long Island, and what we should look for, and what we're tasting. One of the nice things of making wine in America is that we are we have a freedom. We can grow Chardonnay next to Cabernet Sauvignon, which you you know not allowed in Bordeaux. I would make nice Chardonnay, I always say, but they're not allowed to. So we have this wonderful climate, sun-driven, but cool sea breezes. And it's, we make around 12, we make 20 different wines from sparkling wine to dessert wines. And that's what's nice about Chardonnay. Chardonnay is so versatile. We use it for, in our rosé. We use it obviously for the sparkling wine. We make a dessert, a botrytis, like a Sauterne style with Chardonnay. And we make two different Chardonnays, a stainless steel version. And then this year, this is our barrel fermented version. So. Great, a great variety. And uh, from, uh, I would say they're all my children, these wines, but some are just smarter than the others. And this pearl is one of my favorites, I have to say. 
it comes from a Dijon clone 76 small cluster, tiny small cluster, which means there's much more sun exposure. So that what that means is you get a more homogeneous ripening. If you have a huge cluster with lots of berries, there's always green berries inside and they are a little unripe. So you make a compromise between the when are the unripe grapes sort of ripe, when are the overripe grapes too before they totally overripe, and you make a compromise. And that's not what I want to do. I want to when I choose the grapes, the, most of the grapes are at a similar stage of ripening. And that's uh, one of the great conditions with our vineyard, how we expose our fruit. Um, we do leaf removing in the cluster zone for a couple of reasons. One is to get rid of pyrazines, getting rid of any green grassy flavors that would stay on. And we do that right after flowering very early. The great side effect, of course, is that you have better air drainage, better airflow. So you have less disease pressure and you get this long hang time. So Chardonnay in our, in our situation used to be 120 days from mid flowering to mid maturity. And Burgundy, a book in Burgundy says you need 100 days to make a nice Chardonnay. So we are, we used to be 120 with climate change. We are right now at 110 and a half days. So it has been picking now 10, 10 days, two weeks almost earlier than 10, 10, 20 years ago, which is actually you know, a great thing still. So we have long hang time, get ripe seeds. What I do is we hand pick this. I'm fanatic how clean we pick. We have a fantastic, one of the best vineyard manager on the East Coast, Richie Pisacano. That, of course, makes my life a lot easier that we go really clean into this final stage. So you can reap the benefits, we call them here Indian summers, when the whole September, October can be beautifully cool nights, you know, blue sky, nice, strong sea breeze, helping you to dehydrate a little bit and get concentration. We pick super clean, press it immediately, and then I do a 48-hour skin, 48-hour settling of the juice of the lees so that you really have a clean juice going into your barrels 100% barrel fermented in French oak, all French oak, and it's around 19% new oak. 2019 was a beautiful vintage for our reds, for example. It was the best wine in my 30-year history. Whites, of course, Chardonnay, we make for almost every year really good, fantastic wines. So it's not as crucial as for the reds, but nevertheless, it was a dream year. The whole summer and the whole fall was picture perfect. Um, so this is the Chardonnay. Again, seven and a half months to a lease, actually in barrels right behind me. Uh, I love lease contact and I do very little patronage, no stirring of the lease. I want the wine to come together like this so that the next 20 years open up this wine. So there's three goals I have. First one is food friendliness. Wine should be enjoyed with food. And, and if you ever had a our striped bass with this Chardonnay here, Long Island striped bass and Chardonnay, it doesn't get any better than that. Then longevity, I want to prove that we can make Chardonnay that ages 25 years and have, have what it takes to mature a long time and get better, improve over the next 10, 15 years this wine before it finally slowly gets more on the oxidative side, but it depends how you like your wine. And last not least, we want to make style, a style that is true to Long Island, to the Hamptons. Yes, there is Coton Charlemagne, which is a fav my, one of my favorite wines out there, but you have to be true to your region, what is your climate? And at the end, when you do that, nobody else can you know, copy that. So you, you try to make the way the best wine with 2.6 miles from the ocean, the sea breeze gives us this unique minerality, finesse, slate, uh, a part of the concentration and the fruit. So great, great, great place to grow grapes. A lot of passion goes into this wine. Um, it's the the elegance about it, this is not like a Californian wine, which it hits you over the head with either banana and pineapple and whatever tropical fruit or with, with oak. So it's this subtle elegance and then time, the tri-sherry flavors in eight, nine years, it, when there's a bit of marzipan and orange peel coming out. Uh, it's a beautiful wine that matures very nicely, super food friendly. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I can see why you're so, uh, you're so, so, uh, delighted with this vintage and there's there's some lovely comments uh, a fantastic showcase uh, for what Long Island wines can be says Brad uh, uh, a really uh, detailed tasting note um, 
from Patricia. Um, I've got a, a question about uh, for each of you actually about can you could you mention what closure? This is from Tom Canavan. Um, what what closure you use? Do you use screw cap or cork um, on, on the wines that we're tasting, Roman? I use I love the DM cork. The DM this is the DM thirty, which you know has to, because we I like to make a wine that can age twenty five years. So it's a beautiful cork, no cork taints with this cork, and certified sort of, uh, since this cork is around, and that's all our reds, all our top whites go with the DM30. Okay, great. Well, um, stay there, because there'll be more questions, I'm sure, but um, Renee is going to run us through uh, our, our next wine, uh, our non-New York wine. Thank you for the cork as well. Very good. <laughs> Put a cork in it. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and I'll just briefly uh, explain a little bit of, about wine number two from uh, Jean Durup, and we are going to, to Chablis. Uh, Roman talked about um, Long Island, uh, the Hamptons being a, a quite coolish place uh, compared to California, for example, where you're able to get a, 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 a more um, pronounced cool climate style of, of, uh, of Chardonnay. We have to take into account that, remember, please remember that Chardonnay is one of the most difficult grape varieties to guess blindfolded if it's not handled in the classical way. Um, because Chardonnay is really an, a chameleon uh, grape variety, you could say. It, it really takes uh, influence from where it's grown, the soil, the climate and all this. And Chablis is a very, very good example of this. So we are having the, the Champ du Rup, Père et Fils, uh, regularly Chablis, uh, of course, produced 100% uh, of, of Chardonnay. 12.5% um, of, of alcohol, which is, is, is quite typical for a uh, generic uh, village Chablis. Uh, but remember also that it's, it's from 2021, where you probably all of you saw the horrible pictures uh, from April last year with uh, burning candles in, in the vineyards, uh, quite a big reduction in, in, uh, in harvest uh, in that vintage. But uh, several producers, at least of the size of, of John Drup, which is, who's quite a big producer of Chablis, were able to, to get uh, a good harvest uh, anyway. This is made in a very classical, uh, neutral upbringing way in, in Chablis, which means that there are no no oak influence, it's uh, steel, stainless steel based, and they, as I recall it, also have some uh, glass enamels um, uh, casks to, to use for, for the fermentation. And then uh, on, on lease, uh, for a period um, until the, yeah, the, 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 the year after, uh, where it's bottles, uh, of course, and then we have it here. So it's 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 a good example of Chablis taking um, influence from being at Roman mentioned that uh, that uh, New York State is is uh, as, at the same uh, latitude as, as Madrid. Uh, here in, in Chablis, it's it's a latitude of, of 48. Uh, Dijon is 47, uh, and and so it's it's one more degree uh, north. So it's a cold climate, of course, and we have the, the, the typical, very, very uh, limey soil, chalky, uh, the Kimmeridge Mal, uh, which the areas are, are, are very famous for. Some say you can taste this in the wine. So uh, let's see if, if, it, if there were wine where we should be able to taste the influence of the soil, it should be Chablis because the upbringing is uh, ideally so neutral. Great. Uh, well, thank you uh, for that, uh, Rene. Let's bring in um, Peter now. So up to the uh, Finger Lakes um, and Fox Run Vineyards. Fox Run. If you've been to uh, the Finger Lakes, you cannot miss Fox Run because it has an enormous um, kind of uh, metal sign outside with, um, in, uh, with, with foxes on, I think. Um, but anyway, that, that's, that's by the by because we've got some, uh, lots of experience there in the, in the shape of Peter and, and the wine uh, as well. Um, could you um, uh, just uh, introduce us to the wine and introduce us to the Finger Lakes at the same time, if, if you if you could, uh, Peter? Oh, I would need to be a, a, 
uh, one of those things with a puppet. So I want the ventriloquist to yeah. speak simultaneously. Uh, quickly, the, 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 were, were you asking me to talk about the region um, or, or just Fox Run, David? Uh, I think, uh, if you wouldn't mind, for those who don't know the region, just give us a bit of an overview, if you wouldn't mind. So there we are, smack dab. You could fit many European countries inside of um, this state. It's a pretty big place. There's, I think I looked, I overlaid a, a map of Belgium once, and it, it encompasses right nicely that kind of green area, like green where the Finger Lakes is, um, for instance. So we are a long way from the ocean here. Um, Roman loves his his maritime climate. We love to boast about our continental climate. Um, and while we're talking about latitudes, we are on the same latitude as Rioja and Tuscany. Does it mean we have a Mediterranean climate? Of course not. We have this big thing called Canada north of us, whereas uh, the Mediterranean has this big thing called the Sahara Desert. So those kind of um, analogies are fun, but I don't think we could say much more than that. Um, so yes, we get spring frost far more readily than um, the Hamptons would. The good news is that when the spring frost happened, this is around now, a little earlier, um, bud break has not happened yet. We probably have some of the most retarded bud break in, um, dates of any major wine region that I can think of. Buds are still dormant as I speak and they will be uh, pushing out in a few days. The good news is that they grow like crazy after that and they catch up to just about every region. I also wanna take give this region, the Northeast anyway, credit for um, two gifts to the wine world, which is oidium, powdery mildew, that is, and phylloxera, so you're welcome about that. Um, we don't get any hurricanes. I mean, the, the east coast of the U.S. is subject to some pretty devastating hurricanes, especially in the fall. Uh, they tend to escape us here. Um, so we can be a little bit happy about that. And humidity is all over the place, depending not on a, a body of water as much as on rainfall, which can be all over the place. Why don't we taste the wine? Here it is. Um, screw cap. We use eco-friendly bottles, which are kind of lightweight. And I would ask the participants to pay particular attention to two things here. Number one, the price point. This is a price point wine. Um, number two, the fact that there's a little bit of a grape in there that you may not have heard of, which is Traminet. Traminet um, is, is a very popular gra grape in the state of Indiana. It was in fact developed around here one of its parents is Gewurztraminer, as you can probably discern, and the other one is just basically breeding stock. But it's in there on purpose um, to bring a little bit more of a fruit salad influence into this wine. Um, if you taste it, you will. There's what things you will not see: oak influence, no; lees influence, no; malolactic fermentation, no. So it might be easier to define this as what I do not do rather than what I do. The problem here is that when you get kind of indifferently grown fruit, you can end up with a pretty basic um, generic at best wine. And I've had to work hard to, to tease some of the flavors and textures um, out of the grapes to make this. It is really made in the winery and I don't wanna not give credit to grape growing, but this is purchased fruit, all mechanically pruned, harvested, et cetera. Um, luckily, it's grown on the southeast side of Seneca Lake, which is which is known locally as the Banana Belt. Here we are pulling it off our harvester. And uh, the Banana Belt really is the, it's the exceptional thing is that uh, um, very, very steep slopes and lots and lots of afternoon sun. So when the sun's gone down on our side of the, of the lake, um, it's, it's still beating on these grapes. Um, very popular. This is our best selling wine. Um, mostly based on the fact that it's clean and um, non-cerebral, I guess. Also the price of course helps. And we, we position this to be very attractive to the restaurant trade. Uh, a lot of this goes into 1.5 liter bottles in, in screw caps, which restaurants love. So, so you, know, as you know the formula generally, it may apply in Europe as well. 
if you make your money back um, on your the, on the bottle of wine with your first pour, then everything else is a profit. And you know this would be wholesaled at say eight or nine dollars a bottle, and so it's easy to charge eight or nine dollars for the glass, and then the rest is pure profit. That's how we drive the sales of this. Um, so here it is. I, I wish I could get your feedback. I, maybe you could type in some comments. Um, we're getting them already, actually. Uh, so we're getting a real drinkability to this wine, says Brad Horn. Uh, then we've got, a, again, a, from, from Patricia Stefanovic um, and W, uh, um, uh, a, a lovely detailed tasting note again, which is really positive. Excellent uh, rapport, quality, price, um, textured, balanced, herbal lift adds interest. Um, so, you yeah, know, some, some very favorable comments. Um, to talk about Fox Run briefly as well, because it's one of the big... Uh, one of the big, sort of bigger, better known names in the Finger Lakes, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, big it is is relative to the region, etc. We're probably on the big side of medium. There are some much bigger wineries and a lot of ma and pa small wineries. We measure, um, you know, production in cases. I know in Europe they measure in bottles, off quite often. But we're at around twenty to twenty-two thousand cases per year, including some custom winemaking. That's enough to keep me and an assistant busy all year round um, and maybe a little bit too busy. Uh, the, the winery itself was founded in 1990 by a wealthy individual and his wife who really thought that owning a winery was a lifestyle choice and they could build it and sit on their porch and watch the customers roll in, which of course never works no matter what. Um, the present owners have had it since 93. I've been here since 95 as the first and only full-time senior winemaker ever. We also have um, our vineyard manager who was, was here by, uh, when, the, when the vines were first planted. So what I'd like to say about Fox Run is that we are extremely low turnover in the senior level positions. And that's not an accident. We get along with, with, it, with each other very, very well. I mentioned um, Chardonnay and a sense of profile, a style from the Finger Lakes. Um, what, what's your take on that, Peter? Can you elaborate on that quickly? So I um, don't say something wrong. So uh, that there is a cooler climate profile to, to Chardonnay um, and, and it's a million miles from what goes on by and large on the other side of the United States. And that's, this, this is the weather obviously uh, influencing this as much as, as, as winemaking, I, I'm guessing. Sure, yes. Um, it is quite a shock to be drinking these styles. And I don't, use, I don't like to use, you know, European analogs. I tell that my sales staff never to call this a Chablis style, even though they're tempted, it's not. Um, but when you, you know, drink, are used to drinking this kind of lean, sinewy, I won't, I don't use the word minerality, but you, I might in this case, um, style. And then you do encounter a West Coast heavy duty Chardonnay. It's pretty shocking how unrefreshing it is. Um, they would counter in California with what, you know, where's the meat on the bones here. Um, that's not what we want out of Chardonnay. So, you know, leanness, fairly low acid, sorry, fairly high acid, fairly low alcohol, essentially no phenolics here. And again, no oak influence, low, no lees, no malolactic. Now, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, we'll no doubt come back with some uh, questions, some really uh, lovely comments that the, the, the Traminet uh, has attracted some attention as well. Some nice comments um, in the chat function. But uh, Renee, um, next, uh, over to you and the next of our, uh, our showdown wines. Yes, thank you. Um, very briefly, uh, the next two wines, first of all, uh, the New Zealand wine from Marlborough, Villa Maria, uh, one of the top vineyards, uh, the Taylor's Pass vineyards in uh, in Marlborough. Be aware that uh, Marlborough is is quite a big area, and it's quite important in this in this connection that uh, this particular vineyard is actually placed in the Southern Valley, uh, not the Wairau Valley, in uh, Marlborough, which is the northern and much more warmer uh, part of Marlborough. But this is from Awatere uh, Valley, uh, which which is um, cold. Uh, very very windy um, from from uh, from the Pacific uh, Ocean winds. Um, 
the alcohol is thirteen point five, which is a little. Yeah, quite normal for 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 New Zealand uh, Chardonnay for the moment. Uh, but what is important here, because I have the the figure, and I'll, I'll just mention this small detail, because the pH is three point two, which is very low for um, for New Zealand uh, Chardonnay and 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 even for for Chardonnay in in, in general. Uh, a short note on winemaking. Uh, there are some. Important details here. It's 100% barrel fermented, very classic. Only 50% wild fermented, which means that 50% is, is uh, fermented on selected yeast. And it's uh, full mellow with uh, 11 months on, uh, on lease. Right, thank you. I, lo I'm, I love this wine. It's a, a personal favourite of mine, actually. But uh, mm -hmm. so I'm glad, uh, glad we chose this. But we're here to talk primarily about uh, about New York, fairly obviously. So let's bring in Nathan. Um, and um, uh, you you've made wine all over the world, but you've um, you know, as I said in the introduction, uh, Nathan, you were um, you were keen to to come back to the, the Finger Lakes uh, from from where you came and to. Uh, to uh, help build its uh, reputation for for wine. So, um, uh, why, out of interest, why, why were you so determined to, to, to come back home, back home and make wine in the Finger Lakes? Um, well, a very important one is cost. I mean, I couldn't afford to do this scale of operation most places in the world. Um, so there's that. Uh, then I also prefer the cooler climates for uh, grape growing and winemaking and the flavor profiles that come from those climates. And um, then in my travels, I'd go to all these beautiful wine regions across the globe. And every time I came back to the Finger Lakes, I had a fresh set of eyes on it. And the, the natural beauty we have here, it's, you know, it's on par with any other place I visited. And um, could you just tell us a bit more for those who, who uh, haven't been um, to the, the Finger Lakes, and I only went for the first time in uh, in, in March, as I mentioned, and um, I don't think I quite got my head around how far away from New York City it was until I actually made that journey, and I was in an aeroplane, so it was, uh, you know, it is it's a long way um, upstate, and um, the winters can be ferociously cold, can't they? Um, yeah, but I mean, there's kind of been a shift uh, with global warming. Growing up in the region, uh, you know, there was always snow on the ground and it was always cold. And now our winters seem to come in three to four, you know, storms that drop several feet. And then, you know, you might get your 40, 50 degree days in between. So they're not as consistent as they used to be. A little more extreme nowadays. And uh, just talk about, uh, well, in fact, we should, we should introduce your wine, actually. That's what we should do next. If you wouldn't mind telling us about the wine that we're, uh, we're going to pour, first of all. Yeah, so that's a 2012 or 2020 vintage Chardonnay. Uh, the grapes from that, um, Peter talked about the west side or east side. So this is on the west side where we get the morning sun, not necessarily the long afternoon uh, sunshine they get on the other side. Um, the vines are just under 50 years old and which is quite old for the region. Um, but I mean, obviously they've had to do some replants along the way. Uh, the grapes were handpicked. Uh, I crushed them or foot stomped in the cellar. So you get a little bit of a phenolic bite because I don't find the wines. And then the juice is settled overnight, uh, racked into neutral oak barrels for a spontaneous ferment and aged about 11 months on the lees uh, with minimal stirring. <clears throat> so just trying to take it easy on the oak, build out a little bit of texture from the, the maceration as well as the lees aging and partial malolactic fermentation. Especially in a year like to, to the wine. I mentioned st uh, sparkling wines in the introduction. Uh, and we're not tasting one today, but I, um, but I know you're uh, involved uh, in, in making sparkling wines. Is that something that um, it, we're seeing change quite rapidly in, in, in the Finger Lakes? Because you've certainly got the climate for it. Um, it takes a little bit of time to do it just because the, I mean, it's a no brainer from the, the seller or the vineyard perspective, because 
Chardonnay has the advantage naturally of being amongst the first grapes picked. Um, so we can get them clean and ripe every single year. And then with sparkling, you're kind of doubling down on that and picking even earlier. So we can absolutely do it and we can make some world-class sparkling wine, but the, you know, the, the cost, the equipment involved, um, and then, you know, having the, the patience and the money to sit on these wines for several years before release, um, it's happening, but you know, not as fast as I think a lot of us would like it to happen. And uh, what about the uh, extent to which uh, Chardonnay is, is perhaps overshadowed by um, other grape varieties? If you think Finger Lakes, you, I think you tend to think about Riesling, you think about Cabernet Franc. Um, do, you, do you think uh, Chardonnay is, is, um, is, is sort of destined to get a, 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 a bigger profile? Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, right now, you know, we've got a lot of wineries here and you can drive down the road and stop at every winery and everybody's making, you know, one or two really solid Rieslings. Um, but Chardonnay, I think, you know, we just started really taking seriously uh in the last i don't know peter would know better than i do but the uh, riesling certainly had a head start okay long island, uh, long, long island our big competition to chardonnay sauvignon blanc there's certainly again the food friendliness of that and obviously people are familiar with it sauvignon blanc and chardonnay so that's certainly catching up. Chardonnay has been there from the beginning and has the reputation, but Sauvignon Blanc is catching up fast. Great. Well, um, we're, we're getting some lovely comments on the wines again, especially the um, the the um, the acidity in the uh, in, in Nathan's wine, um, fab acidic line, driving good texture, um, uh, delicate finesse, elegance, really bright wine. Um, so some lovely comments. We've, we've got some questions as well. So I think we'll do those in a moment. We've got um, one more uh, wine to bring in uh, from you, Rene. Yes. Uh, again, just briefly, the last wine uh, in this in this collection. Um, yeah, it was mentioned uh, that uh, now that, that, that we are tasting three uh, three different wines from uh, from New York State, uh, two from Long Island and, and two from the Finger Lakes. It's it's pretty obvious, probably for most people, that there are big big differences between the climates in Long Island and uh, the Finger Lakes. Uh, I'll get back to that in a moment because now we're going to um, to Aconcagua. The Aconcagua Valley in uh, in Chile, where one of the top producers of uh, what I would call the the very modern uh, style of of uh, Chardonnay in um, in Chile, Era Solis, um, they make the some of the best uh, Chardonnays now in, in in Chile in in the coastal area of of, uh, of the Aconcagua, uh, up north of of uh, um, Santiago, and. Um, yeah, I mentioned the the, the pH uh, value uh, before on on the New Zealand wine. It's it's actually even lower here. It's it's three point seventeen, which is uh, very very interesting. Again, when you compare this to the numerical um, thirteen percent of of alcohol and also the the style of the wine, which is quite full bodied, but here you also feel the influence of this a little bit more um, reductive. Uh, winemaking reductive style where you have the influence of of, um, of um, uh, volatile sulfites um, adding this struck match effect uh, to this wine and there is another uh, very interesting here uh, thing here because uh, they they choose to to um, only let 45 of 45 percent of of this wine uh, the base wine uh, going through malolactic so um, and there are no there's no new oak uh, at, at, on this wine still 100% oak but all used two three and four times uh, so no new uh, oak on on this wine and that's that's a new uh, new thing for for yeah you could say even Chilean Chardonnay for sure but but in general uh, in a, in a more world uh, a global perspective. 
if I may end with with just a, a short comment, uh, just uh, a thing that that, that, I, that I've been noticing on on these wines, especially from the Finger Lakes. Besides the difference between Long Island Chardonnay and the Finger Lakes style, it is the the low alcohol, uh, twelve point zero or twelve point five, uh, but still phenolic maturity, um, which on an international level. Um, makes a quite unique style, I think, uh, for, for the Finger Lakes. Uh, so it adds to, to, uh, to the complexity of the, in the, of the picture of, of the global, globalist, global styles of, of uh, Chardonnay. What, what's nice is, I think, especially as people looking at, are more aware of how much alcohol is in their wine and they don't want always a 15, 16 volume percent wine. So what hot climates are not, you know, traditional, these other climates, they are forced to pick early. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's the big difference. I think in New York, in, you know, you can pick later, you have a choice, but uh, certainly on Long Island, but you can get these ripe phenolics yet you have 12 and a half volume percent and that's not happening easily in other climates. Um, a question from Jane Clare uh, about um, which um, oak um, where it's used tends to be um, preferred. Um, I think, Roman, you were talking about using, uh, is it exclusively French oak in your case? We use only French barrels. Um, you know, it's a mixture of usually Allier and Nevers, the two oak types. I like in the past, in the olden days, we used uh, medium toast or medium plus. Now we are using medium or, or light toast. So not as, in, not as strong toastiness anymore. Luckily things have gone away from the heavy oak type. Um, so that's the oak barrels, but I've seen people using Hungarian oak here in Long Island and, you know, even some American and there is room, there is certainly, you know, in, in small portions, it can be a really a, a nice spice, a nice addition to the wine. Peter or Nathan, what about uh, in the Finger Lakes? Is, is there a, a preference um, in terms of um, the, 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 um, the, the, the oak um, as, as a rule or does it vary? I know it's not strictly relevant to, to one of the wines today? Uh, Nate will have a different answer, I expect, but keep in mind that we are not dedicating our barrels to Chardonnay for the life of the barrel. Sometimes we want to kick them into the red program. I would never use a brand new barrel on red wine because it's just too aggressive. So my tendency is to buy, buy new barrels and then break them in with fermenting Chardonnay. This is not one of them, of course, but and then that tames some of the more aggressive characters. As far as where the barrels come from, I've been in tastings, a, a lot of tastings in many places where a group of winemakers could not tell which reliably whether a barrel was American or French you know, that all the received wisdom says, well, if it smells like coconut or vanilla, then it's gotta be American. If it smells more spicy or whatever, it's gotta be French. Um, sort of true, but it's really hard to do that, to, to figure out which is which in a blind tasting, primarily because cooperage practices in the US with American oak are so much better than they used to be. So they're no longer kind of caricatures of themselves. Um, that said, you know, an American barrel is about a third the price of a French barrel right now. And when we're working with price point wines, um, spending that much money on a French barrel just for the bragging rights may not have a lot of merit. Nate? Uh, yeah, so personally, I work exclusively with French oak barrels. But with that being said, um, when I get them, they're five years old. And then I put uh, the Chardonnay and the sparkling wines in five, six, seven-year-old barrels just to kind of pull out that last little bit of flavor. And then after eight years, they all go to the Riesling program. But I mean, that's just my take on it. And I mean, it barrels that old, it's more of a textural component than a flavor. Okay. Did you mention, Nathan, what uh, closure your wine is under, by the way? I can't remember. I didn't, but it's a uh, natural cork. And again, that's just, um, you know, what, whether you're making wine for a uh, cork closure or a screw cap, like you have to change your approach to the process. And I'm just kind of, this is how I learned how to make wine. You know, I'm very inexperienced when it comes to screw caps and that process of uh, production. 
Um, let's. Uh, it's probably time to, to wrap up fairly shortly. But um, there was uh, there was a question earlier about um, about the, what, what you guys see as the future for for New York wines, which is a, a big question. I appreciate. But if if I could put that to each of you, starting uh, down in um, Long Island with you, uh, Roman. Well, on Long Island, you know, prejudice was the hardest thing to overcome. I think you know, for people and for wine, and we've been working very hard and I think the future looks great because the whole world has experienced you know weather issues doesn't matter if you're in France or in who knows Australia or in California with fires and so in the future if you want the greatest wine you have to look where was the greatest vintage and one year it will be on the Finger Lakes one year it will be in Long Island and one year it will be in New Zealand and in Burgundy so I think that's where the future goes and that makes us sustainable. We farm sustainable and in the long run makes us in general as a business sustainable that when they, we have a great vintage, the collectors will come and look for our top, top wines and spend accordingly. And this way we can, anybody can survive a difficult year. And same we will be with Burgundy and Cote de Rhone and wherever you go. Peter, you've got uh, thoughts on, on where you see uh, the, 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 the region going? We are not seeing some of the catastrophic uh, effects of global warming. I think um, my colleagues mentioned that a little bit um, as they are in say Alsace and Bordeaux and a few other places. So we're not staring down the barrel of a, you know, some having to replant with other grapes. It's really not getting warmer here as much as getting more bizarre in terms of weather um, events. So, you know, extremely high rainfall years, more droughty years, that kind of thing. So more, uh, you know, a wider bell curve, but it's not like we are looking to, to plant, you know, Zinfandel here at, at any point in the future. And in fact, there's a big, you know, a very strong market for French American hybrids, many of which were developed around here, um, which we haven't really talked about, but the, you know, these wines and these grapes have a lot of, of very strong supporters, including Jancis. She kind of sees us as, as having a, a big future in, in uh, French American hybrids. So I'm dodging the question, but the real answer is we shall see. Yeah, okay. No, but you're right. She, I interviewed her for the, uh, your, uh, your sort of co uh, conference last year, remotely on Zoom, and, and she was, she said exactly that. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, that's 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 high praise. Um, Nathan, what about uh, your sort of predictions for the future? Um, yeah, Peter hit the nail on the head with, you know, the interest in hybrids and whatnot. Um, so there's that. But me personally, uh, coming off all these extreme seasons that we're seeing and how radically different they are, um, I, I, I'm personally betting on sparkling wines. Just because, again, you know, you're picking them so early in the season that I would argue that those are the most consistent wines produced from the Finger Lakes in any given year. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Some really um, uh, lovely comments um, for the the wines, which I hope you guys will get to um, get to see, and 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 uh, and also for the choice of wines with the very different profiles um, and price points, we should say as well, actually that. Um, uh, that we we had in these wines. Um, Rene, anything you'd like to uh, to add before we wrap up? Just say uh, thank you to the three producers of, of New York uh, Chardonnay. Uh, pretty impressive uh, work uh, on this great variety. And 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 uh, as a teacher and, and lecturer in in, uh, in in American Chardonnay, it's very very interesting to see that even inside New York State, which is uh, in our teaching number four state after. California and Washington and, and Oregon, there are huge differences in style. And uh, that's always interesting. So thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. It's, uh, it's been in case really... anybody will come, If case anybody comes to the Pro Wine, we'll have a booth at the Pro Wine Wolfer Estate. You can taste reds, you can taste our rosés and other wines. So just you can get yourself more familiar with New York wines. Right. Well, I think we all want to do that. So uh, enjoy Provine as well. Um, and um, thank you very much to, to everyone for uh, for the questions, for the engagement. Uh, these uh, are always uh, you know, well attended and 
and um, and we get a lot of really good uh, comments and a lot of engagement from people. So it's um, I think it's uh, it's great. So um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know you're busy guys. So uh, Nathan, Peter, and, and Roman, thank you uh, for uh, answering those questions, and thank you to everyone for uh, taking part and being uh, a part of it. Thank you to our wonderful host. Go New York. And thanks to all of you. Um, and just a reminder, quick one, um, that you will all receive a recording of today's webinar. So we'll publish that to the YouTube channel uh, for New York. And then we'll go ahead and send out that link so you can review at your leisure. Uh, thank you all for being a part of this series. Hope it um, offered some great context um, just seeing these New York wines uh, on a global stage. So take good care and uh, we'll see you on another webinar very soon.